5.3 Evaluating Definite Integrals. In this section we're going to learn the evaluation theorem and that's going to allow us to evaluate a definite integral without having to use a Riemann sum and to get an exact answer. A definite integral basically means that I'm going between two points. Before we were doing indefinite integrals in the other section when we were just talking about antiderivatives trying to go backwards and we had to do remember the plus C thing well that was because we didn't really know where we were well now we are definitely doing it between two points A and B so we read this as the integral from A to B and we always put the smaller number on the bottom the integral from A to B of f of x dx so we're taking the antiderivative of f of x and we define that as big F of B minus big F of A. Remember, big F is the antiderivative function. So we're going to have to go backwards. You'll remember that in our last section, if we add some function, F of X equals X squared, then one solution, okay, an antiderivative, one possible solution was one-third X cubed. Remember, you added 1 and then divided by whatever you added so that when you take the derivative of this, you get that. Okay, we're going backwards. And remember that in our last section, we said the general solution is 1 third x cubed plus c. So we're just saying one possible solution is 1 third x cubed. But when we're doing the definite integral, what we do here is we say, all right, that's going to be f of 1 minus f of 0. And so we just put it in here. We get 1 third x cubed minus 1 third x cubed. And we stick in a 1, we stick in a 0. You don't have to worry about the plus c because the plus c minus the c is going to be 0. So our answer is just a number. And this is equivalent to if I used a Riemann sum, but this is much easier. So in this example here, we again need to take the antiderivative of the function e to the x. And the antiderivative of the function e to the x is just e to the x. So I'll walk you through how I write it. The antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And we want to evaluate this between 1 and 3. So that's how I write it. Or you can write e to the x evaluated between 1 and 3. Okay, these are synonymous. But that just means you do e to the third minus e to the first. And again, this is the same thing because I'm doing I'm evaluating it at 3 minus evaluating it at 1. And that's it. So you can use this notation or this notation. I go back and forth, honestly. Find the area under the curve. The area under the curve just means the antiderivative. From 0 to b, where 0 is less than or equal to b, which is less than or equal to pi over 2. The reason that we need to know this is because we know that we're dealing with a function that is just above the axis. We want to go from 0 to b of the cosine function. And we want to do dx because our variable is x in this case. So what is the antiderivative of cosine? So we take away the squiggly and the dx when we take the antiderivative. So what is the antiderivative of cosine? It's sine. And we're evaluating it between 0 and b. So we take away the integral sign as soon as we take the antiderivative. So then we evaluate, and we just use, go back to this evaluation theorem, f of b minus f of a. So we stick in, this is a b and this is a, sine b minus sine 0. And the sine of 0 is just 
What is the y coordinate at this point? It's just zero. Sine of zero is zero. So our answer is just sine of b. Done. Indefinite integrals. So a definite integral was between some a and b. An indefinite integral is just saying, let's take the antiderivative, but we don't know where we're going between. So that's where our general case is going to get the plus c. Let's just read through it all. Because of the relation between antiderivatives and integrals, the notation, the antiderivative of f of x dx, is traditionally used for an antiderivative of f and is called an indefinite integral because I don't have any bounds on my integral. So that is just saying what is the function whose derivative is little f of x. Remember, if big F is an antiderivative of little f on an interval i, then the most general antiderivative of little f on this interval is the antiderivative f of x plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. So an indefinite integral can be represented by a particular antiderivative of f or an entire family of antiderivatives meaning the answer is a function or family of functions. And that's our plus C. So here is a table of the antiderivatives. It's just going backwards. Honestly, I do not memorize these at all. I just memorize the derivatives, and then I go backwards. Uh, the only things you have to be careful of when you're doing the antiderivative of 1 over x, it's ln absolute value of x. You can't forget that absolute value. And you probably want to memorize this one. But other than that, you can really just go backwards in, in your head. Find the general indefinite integral. All right, so we just need to go backwards here. I'm just going to rewrite it. The antiderivative of this, so we have 10 times the antiderivative of x to the fourth, add 1, and then just divide minus 2. The antiderivative of secant squared, remember, is just tangent. And then don't forget your plus c. So we have 2x to the fifth minus 2 tan x plus c. And here's just the graph of the antiderivative for several different values of c. How do we do this one? How do we undo a division problem? Remember, the key to these problems is simplify first if you can. Always. And so let's simplify. Divide everything by t squared and we get 2 plus, we just have root t, so I'm going to write t to the 1 half, minus 1 over t squared is just t to the negative 2. So I still have the squiggly and the dt because I haven't done anything yet. All I've done is simplify. Now I'm going to take the antiderivative. 2t plus add 1. Add 1. And you're dividing by negative 1, so I'm just going to turn that into a plus sign. And where are we evaluating this? from 1 to 9. So, first let's stick in a 9 everywhere. Minus, and now let's just stick in a 1 everywhere. f of b minus f of a. Eighteen plus, let's see, the square root is three, three cubed is twenty seven. And you should get thirty two and four nine. 
Yes. The net change theorem is just the same thing, except um, we're just talking about rates of change. So it's kind of, you know, just our little application. So another interpretation of big F prime represents the rate of change of big F of x with respect to x. And f of b minus f of a is the net change in y when x changes from a to b. Of course, here's our little application. If V of T is the volume of water in a reservoir at time T, then its derivative, V prime of T, is a rate at which the water flows into the reservoir at time T. What's in black here is very important. You have to be able to interpret something like, you know, they might ask you, what is an interpretation of this? And you should be able to say, well, that is the change in the the amount of water in the reservoir between time one and time two. You should be able to identify that as V of T2 minus V of T1. And again, why? Because the antiderivative of V prime is just V, and I need to evaluate it. So basically, the intermediate step here is the antiderivative of that is just V of T, and I need to evaluate it between T1 and T2. And so I get that. That interpretation is something that you're going to need to be able to do. And it seems very obvious, but just make sure that you really understand what's going on. Similarly, if an object moves along a straight line with a position function s of t, then its velocity is v of t, which is the derivative of s prime of t. And so if you're taking the antiderivative of the velocity function, well, you know the antiderivative of the velocity is the position function, and you need to evaluate that between t1 and t2, so you get s of t2 minus s of t1. In other words, the displacement of the particle from time 1 to time 2. Recall that the distance traveled is not the same as displacement. If we want to calculate the distance traveled during the time interval, then we have to consider the intervals when it's moving forwards and backwards, and we've done this a bunch, a bunch of times. But an easy way to now think of it, now that we know formally the antiderivative and the notation, what we want to do is we want to take the absolute value of velocity, take the antiderivative of the absolute value of velocity, because basically what you want to do is make everything that was negative into positive. So you add up all of the distances instead of sometimes adding and sometimes subtracting. So an example here would be a particle moves along a line. Here's the velocity. Find the displacement, let's just call this A and B. So the displacement is just simple, the antiderivative of the velocity. And so that is just going to be antiderivative of t squared is one third t cubed minus one-half t squared minus 6t. Evaluate that between 1 and 4. And so we'll stick in a 4 everywhere. And then we'll stick in a 1 everywhere. So you should get negative 9 halves meters. What does that mean? That means that the particle position at t equals 4 is 4 and a half meters to the left of its position at time equals 1. If I want to do the distance traveled, you can do it your good old-fashioned way, or you can just do it this way. 
the only way to evaluate this is to go your good old fashioned way to see when it's moving forward and when it's moving backwards and add up two separate antiderivatives, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But a shortcut, if this is on the calculator section, is to use fn int. fn int is like n deriv, and you'll also find that under your math menu, and 9 is fn int. It's right after um, n deriv. And the notation you're going to do here is just the function. So the function you're going to put in y1 put in your velocity function and then you're going to do absolute value if you don't know where absolute value is use catalog it's the easiest way everything is there if you forget just use catalog um, absolute value of y1 because that's what we want and then you just use the variable so our variable is x because we're using an x as our variable. And then you do your lower and your upper bound. So that's the notation for fn int. And it should spit out the answer and so that's your distance traveled. We do this if we didn't have a calculator. Well, our velocity function is t squared minus t minus 6. Let's just go ahead and factor that. All right, so where is this thing moving forward and backwards? Let's make a number line. All right, it changes at negative 2 and at 3. Let's see our signs. If we put in negative 3, we would get a negative times a negative, put in a zero, we would get a negative times a positive, um, and then you get a positive. And our interval that we were dealing with was from one to four, right? And so we know it was going backwards or left from one to three, and then it was going to the right from three to four. So, in order to evaluate this, we know that it was going one direction from one to three seconds. We know that this is going to be negative at the end of the day, right, because it was going left. So, we need to take the absolute value to take it positive, and just for good measure, I just always take the absolute value, even though I know this one's going to be positive because it was moving right here. Okay, so what do I get if I'm doing this all by hand? I just take the antiderivative, so it's just the same as we did before, one-third t cubed minus one-half t squared minus six we need to do it between 1 and 3 and then from 3 to 4 and go ahead and do that and you should get the same answer make sure you do make sure you know how to do it both ways but definitely definitely if you have your calculator you should be using fnint and that's the end of this lesson.